Today we will discuss some emerging advanced microscopy methods that are collectively called as super resolution techniques. The name super resolution here refers to the ability of these techniques to provide image resolution that is much better than the standard diffraction limit. In particular, I will discuss three types of microscopes, the SIM, STED and the STOM. As discussed in the previous lectures, the lateral resolution of a microscope depends on the wavelength lambda of illumination and the numerical aperture of the microscope objective used. The diffraction limited resolution is given by lambda divided by n. So for a microscope that uses visible light at lambda equal to 500 nanometers and one of the best possible n is of 1.4 say for oil objectives, the resolution that you can obtain is about 350 nanometers. Now this resolution is not sufficient to see fine features or fine objects like cell organelles when you use microscopes. Let us first understand why this diffraction limit exists. When we illuminate a sample by this illumination as shown in this figure, we can see that the scattered light from the sample can be classified into two main categories. First, we see these yellow rays which refers to low angle scattering or scattering due to features that are much larger than the diffraction limit of the microscope. Secondly, we also see these orange colored rays which denote the scattered light that corresponds to features that are much smaller than the diffraction limit of the microscope. As you can see, only the yellow rays here contribute to image formation and the information in these orange rays never contributes to the image and this is completely lost. How do we recover this information? So one of the simplest ways to access this high frequency information is to use a tilted illumination as shown here. You can see here that now the yellow rays correspond to scattered light that is uh, due to that is due to uh, large features and this light now escapes the microscope objective. The orange rays which refer to scattering from small or finer features however is now captured by the objective and as a result contributes to image formation. If we look at this from the Fourier plane we see that if we use normal illumination versus tilted illumination a different region of Fourier space is accessible by the microscope. The structural illumination microscope or SIM depends on this type of principle. We can see that when a fine high resolution structure is present right next to the sample or alternatively if the illumination is not uniform but is structured with very fine features then the orange ray that is shown here which would have otherwise escaped your microscope objective is now turned around and contributes to image formation. What is different now is that the image formed by this type of system is not a usual image that can be interpreted visually but it is some form of a coded image which needs to be decoded mathematically to get the right high resolution image. If we look at it from Fourier space we see the inner red circle that corresponds to low frequencies corresponding to diffraction limited resolution whereas the tilted illumination for example can provide access to higher frequencies in Fourier space and lead to higher resolution features. To see an example this is how you will look this is how you will see the image of a sample under usual microscope whereas if you use the same images and decode them mathematically then the same sample can provide much higher resolution and hence much more useful information. Next we will discuss the principle behind the STED microscope. STED here stands for stimulated emission depletion. What is the STED principle? Usually this type of microscope 
is operated in fluorescent mode but with a slight twist. In fluorescence, a, a fluorophore is first excited by an excitation light pulse and then it decays non-radiatively to a lower metastable state. From this state, a spontaneous emission or fluorescence occurs and the fluorophore again goes back to the ground state. But instead of letting this process go, we can prevent this spontaneous emission by having an additional depletion light pulse. This depletion light pulse is designed such that instead of the fluorescent or spontaneous emission, it will lead to stimulated emission at a wavelength that is much different or significantly different from the fluorescence wave. So this stimulated emission can be blocked by using an appropriate color filter. So what we see is that having the depletion pulse, we can suppress the fluorescence process. Now, can this depletion be avoided over a sub-diffraction spot? This is what is done in the STED microscope. To achieve this particular feature, the beam that is used is actually a twisted or helical phase beam, which is known to have dark core, which is sub-diffraction size or about 100 nanometer size. To achieve STED microscopy, at resolution down to 100 nanometers, what is done is first you excite the sample with this green light as shown here. The excitation region is shown by a green spot in this figure. The second pulse, which is the stead pulse, is actually this donut shaped pulse with a dark core. What we see is that the stead pulse depletes the fluorescence in the region all over the spot size except at the center where there is a dark core and so the fluorescence still survives. If we scan this dark core over the sample, then you can actually achieve imaging at 100 nanometer resolution. As an example, you can see the transition from confocal to a stead image. Clearly, although confocal is considered quite a high end system, you can see that it is diffraction limited and so the same sample under confocal microscope looks much more blurred. So the stead can provide much more information than a usual confocal mode. Finally, we will discuss another technique which can take us down further in the resolution. This type of technique is known as localization microscopy. One of the uh, localization microscope techniques is known as STORM or stochastic reconstruction microscopy. The idea behind this is quite simple. Let us consider a two-point fluorescent object where the two points are actually located at a distance closer than the diffraction limited spot size of the system. When both the point sources are on simultaneously and if you record them using a fluorescent microscope, you will see a blurred image as shown here. The image is blurred because the size of the diffraction spot is much larger than the separation between the two points. And so just by looking at the blurred image, we cannot separate or resolve these two point sources. So when both point sources are present, it is difficult to distinguish them. But how about we can turn these two point sources on one by one, then the situation changes and maybe you can get much higher resolution. For example, let us consider at time t1 that we can turn on one of the spots. The diffraction limited spot size is again quite big. So corresponding to this single point source, you still get a blurred image. But I can now compute the centroid of this large blurred spot. At time t2, I can activate the second fluorescent center and calculate again the centroid of the corresponding blurred spot. These two centroids can then be combined and a composite image is obtained where the two point sources are now well resolved. To do this in a microscope, particularly you need photo switchable fluorescent dyes or tags. They have special property that you can turn them on or dark state in on or dark state with appropriate laser pulses. Another trick that is employed in this type of microscope is that a weak activation pulse is used so that in any given frame, 
only a sparse set of fluorescent molecules in the sample which are separated far apart are actually activated. Typically, you need to record thousands of such frames where a sparse set of molecules are activated. In each frame, you have to calculate the centroid positions for the blurred spots and then you can make one composite image which has extremely high resolution. As an example, you can see this image of the actin filaments. You can see that in a usual microscope with diffraction limited resolution, you cannot resolve them at all. Whereas with the storm microscope, you can see them very, very clearly. Now, the accuracy of centroid location depends on the number of photons that are collected in each of these blurred spots. So more the number of photons you collect, the better is your accuracy. But for typical illumination situations, you can get about thousands of photons and uh, you can get a resolution down to about 20 nanometers. So we are now almost talking of molecular level resolution. In summary, we can see that super resolution techniques provide much more information over conventional microscopes. And when you have information on newer scales, that can enable new discoveries in basic biosciences. Another point I want you to note is that the super resolution techniques inherently use multidisciplinary concepts. So we are combining now ideas from physics, chemistry, also in addition to sophisticated computation methods for ultra high resolution image formation. So there is a lot of scope for people from different disciplines to come together and contribute to this field. Thank you for your attention. Uh, these microscopes, are they using, they are like optical microscopes giving images or are they computationally enhanced? No, they are not enhanced. See, the point is they are all optical microscopes, but usually the optical microscope is not collecting the information about high frequency or fine features of the object. Here what is happen, what happens is you are actually collecting the information about the high frequency details of the object. So the image recorded is not viewable directly or you cannot interpret it, but you know how it is coded. And so mathematically you can decode it. So this is inherently a computational microscope system where you have to think of the optics and computation as together giving you a performance that is better than just image enhancement or just designing a better optics. Okay. So in all three systems, can we use fluorescent uh, probes? Also? Yes, so they are all depend, uh, dependent on using fluorescence in some sense. Yes, so they are all uh, fluorescent based technique. So in strong methods, yes. we need a, some special kind of fluorophore, right? Yes, it is uh, typically uh, meaning early when this method was developed, there were some uh, special uh, dyes made. But recently people have been showing that uh, even the standard Alexa fluors also can be used. So, uh, so it's not really uh, that you always need extremely special dyes. But yes, initially they started with cyanine dyes uh, with some composites of uh, cyanine 5 and cyanine 3 or something. But uh, recently the things have been changing a little bit. Or maybe, uh, maybe we can couple them with the antibodies. Yeah, you can couple with something. <laughs> So how, how would be the difference in the cost, you know, from the traditional fluorescent The cost is quite high currently because, uh, see, first of all, um, you know, you're essentially getting signals out of, uh, to some extent, very small area of the sample, 100 nanometer or 50 nanometer. So light uh, that you can get out of that is actually quite uh, little. And as a result, uh, you really need uh, very high power lasers to, uh, excite this fluorescence and get enough light from these fluorescent centers. And so as a result, the cost uh, of these systems currently uh, is quite high, except uh, meaning typically uh, only two or three vendors are actually selling this. Although uh, recently there are articles that show that how you can build this type of system at much cheaper cost in your lab. You don't have to actually go for very high power lasers. You can have laser diodes instead of uh, good collimated lasers. So uh, it's kind of a research field. So although at present the few commercial vendors who sell it, they will definitely sell it for a very high price, claiming uh, very high performance. But certainly it is a, a research area. So it is possible that in five years, some other ideas will come and uh, the cost can be lowered. 
Well, uh, the two things. How about the live imaging? Can we do the live imaging? Yes, so uh, live imaging uh, is possible, meaning to the extent that you can do confocal live imaging, that is possible. Storm is a little bit different because you are collecting a lot of these uh, images, thousands of images. So live is not as live as you would like probably, but uh, the stead and sim are reasonably fast. You can, meaning at the same rate as confocal, you can do uh, live image. If you call that as a live image. Okay, and what is the state of the art in terms of the evol evol evolving some kind of system in India? I think that there are ways in which you can actually uh, build can this yourself. I think we can find you. Yes. But it will require newer ideas. You, if you just try to copy what uh, these vendors are doing, then probably it will cost you the same. You need a little bit different ideas and uh, that can reduce the cost without uh, compromising on the performance. In terms of res resolution, how deep can we see inside the cell? Means can we see the mitochondria or the inside structures of that? Yes, I think so. So, 20 nanometers as you say, for the uh, storm at least. But uh, okay, others you can still go down to 100 nanometers, which... Well, you know, very uh, theoretical question. Yes. Right? Since, you know, we don't see directly, the image we don't see directly. Yes. It's a basically, you capture an emitted light. Yes. You deconvolute it, well, you code it and you then deconvolute it. You capture it in a coded form. Exactly. Yes. And then you recover it. Yes. yes. So does it matter the wavelength has to be in the visible range? See, the point is uh, the reason for using visible range is that uh, typically it is less harmful for biological samples. But you can go to other wavelength regimes. You would not probably like to see biological samples with UV, for example. Okay. But uh, these ideas are not really dependent on wavelength uh, to some extent. They so, are. So what we, wh what if we use a wavelength shorter than 200 or 300? Yes. So you can use that, but then you may end up burning the sample. Okay. So it's a the a visible light is typically used uh, to avoid uh, harming the, you know, avoid harming the sample itself when you are studying. It. So that is why microscopy is mostly done with visible light. There, there is another reason is because of this reason, to some extent, lot of sources and detectors are mostly available in visible. If you want to buy a UV camera, it is much harder to buy it today or it will be much more costlier. Or to make a UV laser, it's much more costlier than a UV or, or a visible laser, for example. To some extent, that is how technology has evolved. But there is no reason why you should not go technically to other web. But I thought your question was a little more deep that now you are not really seeing what you recorded visually. Yeah. But this is a complete, again, I would call this as a uh, shift in how imaging is done today. That uh, you no, no longer think of imaging as just image formation on a sensor. So that's, meaning see, I argue it this way that we had film based cameras, we shifted to digital cameras. Physics wise, we have not changed much. We have just recorded, uh, miniaturized and we have recorded it on a sensor. But the real challenge now is to go beyond this, that just changing hardware uh, improvements. But now, once you have this digital data available, you could start thinking of, uh, well, can I, do I really have to record in the same way as the film? Because in film, you had only choice was you recorded it, then you had the film, you had to develop it. On the other hand, uh, now you have a data uh, so you can think of it as a whole process, as an information transfer from your object to your image space. And it could be in a coded way. And uh, it, is, it makes sense to do it uh, because uh, today we see many systems where by this uh, computational type approach, you can improve uh, the resolution or noise performance uh, much beyond what alone hardware could give you or alone Photoshop could give you. Okay, so if I take the low resolution image, it doesn't inherently have information. So if whatever I try to do with it, I will never get the same resolution back. So the right way to go forward is not to build a detector which is having that many small pixels, you know, a smaller sized pixel, but the right way to go is to do something clever, that you try to capture this information in some form that maybe not uh, directly visually meaningful to you, 
but you know how you have coded, you believe how light propagates, you know, you have theories for that. And so based on it, you can decode this. And overall, the performance is uh, going to be much higher. So almost every imaging research that I see today, this is a general theme and it's very powerful. So actually, I just want to know, like uh, in uh, structured illumination, uh, yeah. what we are doing is we are incidenting the light at a tilt angle instead of normally incidenting it. So tilt is just one of the ways. One yeah. of the way. Uh -huh. Other the uh, the other way is it possible also to uh, illuminate it with some interference pattern itself? Yes. So you can have any structure whose uh, features are smaller than the diffraction limited spot. But as we know in interference like we can't go to beyond uh, less than lambda by 2. Yeah, uh, so it, interference may not be sufficient always, yeah, okay. That's right. so, so you can, you probably need something else, okay. Uh, actually I have one basic question. Mm. Uh, suppose we have an object yeah. uh, and, uh, and we are incidenting it. So along the direction of that incident beam, uh, the spatial frequency is less. Uh, and if you go towards uh, left and right, uh, the spatial frequency gradually incre increases. Yes. Uh, and the spatial frequency, uh, actually the sharp uh, edge, uh, sharp objects, they have uh, more spatial frequency. Mm -hmm. So why physically, what is the meaning of that? Uh, why that sharp edges always uh, diffracts really uh, at greater angle? Uh, I think uh, basically you can think of this diffraction phenomena in terms of, you know, like the angular spectrum. And there the answer is there in that that uh, the high frequencies scatter as plane waves that are going f far away from the... Why sharp edges scatter? Okay, the sharp edge actually means that uh, you are changing the object uh, by a large amount within a short distance. So that amounts to having a very high frequency. So if you think of a picture, the high frequency feature is where, you know, the object is changing too fast and low frequency feature is where, you know, there is a smooth region, okay. So, the frequency is to be understood that way and so if you think of a sharp edge then uh, you are making very large change in very small uh, dimension and that causes the special frequency to be very high. In Stedden storm, how can you collect higher frequency because you are missing higher frequency? You are not collecting it just uh, same like uh, sim. Mm -hmm. So Stedden storm instead for example you are controlling the region from which uh, fluorescence occurs. So as a result, if I allow fluorescence only from this 100 nanometer spot, then I know that there could be only few molecules at most that will have fluorescence from that region, and then you are scanning over it. So then, uh, so, and in the uh, storm, you are actually finding cent uh, this centroid calculation, so which is not exactly like, you know, capturing that higher frequency, but uh, these are some, uh, there is an alternate way of uh, saying that I have high frequency information because uh, by the way that data was collected, I have kind of uh, gated it to have uh, fluorescence only from single molecule or from a small region of the sample, okay. So same idea is not, uh, it's quite different from uh, having stead or storm. Same you are actually putting some scattering structure or illuminating. Uh, with a structured beam, but now it is uh, in these two, it is quite different. Uh, so in state, uh, so like in laser, we we need uh, some special conditions like four level system. So so only the difference is fluorescence material or yeah, it is essentially in that material you should also have uh, that stimulated emission possibility, right? So and the stimulated emission, if you look at the fluorescence spectrum, the fluor uh, stimulated emission you can arrange to have uh, outside this fluorescent spectrum. So that is what is typically done for a step. So it is still, there is, you have one band here, one band here, but there would be another transition allowed from the upper band to lower band, uh, which is now not happening because of uh, fluorescence, but because of second pulse, which is causing stimulated emission. And what STED is trying to do is uh, avoiding that uh, stimulated emission over a very small region and as a result fluorescence can still occur from that region and then you are going to scan this spot over the sample and then collect the sample. Okay.